Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hi, thanks for joining us again on Celebrating Act 2. Art and I have a very special guest. Mm. He's not only a notable, you'll recognize his name and you'll certainly recognize his uh, work, his career, but he's also a member of our tribe. <laughs> he happens to be a little bit over 50. <laughs> Yeah, so um, our, our guest is the quintessential celebrating Act Two uh, uh, audience. Uh, as John said, he's a member of our tribe, but he has not only had a successful career, uh, his, uh, along the way he's picked up something like 14 Emmys, two Peabody's, and so much more that you'll hear a bit about now. And we're going to be talking about his uh, new book, uh, My Place in the Sun. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to... Uh, welcome our guest, George Stevens, Jr. Uh, hi, hey, George. George. Good to see you. Very, very nice to be with both of you. Thank you. Now, George, uh, I have read the book, and I'm, I'm impressed that you finally decided to get around to your memoirs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what took you so long? You, you've, you've lived such a full uh, full life. You've done so much. You could have written this three times over by now, but yeah. But well, I, I, I think one thing, um, John, is that uh, I've always been sort of active and looking forward, and I was disinclined to look back. And I, there finally came a time, and COVID helped it, that I was had this sort of enforced captivity, and. Uh, and it gave me time, and I really kind of broke the back of it and and finished it during the two years of COVID. Well, well it's, I, a, uh, it's a wonderful book. Yeah, and, and I'd like I, to say that uh, I read it as well, and I saw it as um, uh, it's actually a, a bunch of things. It's a bi very much a biography of your dad. It's an autobiography to some extent of your life, quite well done, and it's a love story of family. And, right. uh, and what's really fun for our audience is that many of the names, many of the experiences are like the, the, the songs of our youth and the songs of our, our life as well. So you are, you are the leader of the pack, if you will. <laughs> yeah. And, and I had the good fortune of, of knowing and working with uh, so many interesting people. And... I was conscious when I started this book, I read memoirs that basically are a lot of name dropping, you know, and yeah. and I, I had my rule. I said that Cary Grant is not going to be in this book unless I have a very good story about Cary Grant. <laughs> and so there are a lot of people who aren't mentioned who I love very much, but um, the ones that I do mention of prominence, um, they, in some way, uh, affected my life in an interesting way, or we did something together. And and uh, I was pleased that a playwright friend of mine said that he, he loved the book, and he said, you can't skim it because you keep wondering who's going to come on the stage next. Yes, yeah. Well, it is it is a, a, a dream book for name droppers because <laughs> you you've lived through so many eras and uh, worked with closely with so many uh, notable people. I want to start, if you don't mind, I was, I love the opening, uh, right. which is all about your family. Yeah. And you've come from a, I'll call it a show business family. Your grandparents were on the stage. Now they weren't in vaudeville, they were, but they were actors. Am I correct? Well, my, 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 maternal grandmother was in vaudeville and then came to silent films and yeah. my my father's mother and father were very prominent on the stage in san francisco and touring the country my great grandmother um georgia woodthorpe uh was the was born in san francisco just after the civil war and she is the youngest ophelia to ever play with the great uh, edmund Booth, the yeah. greatest Hamlet of American history. So she started five generations of 
Stevens is in show business. Right, that's, which, that's by the way, continues. Uh, and we're not going to go much into it at all because people can read the details of the book, but it continues with your children as well. Exactly. Yeah. That, that, yeah. that takes it into the fifth and, and, and possibly a sixth generation. We don't know yet. Right. So I, I love the, the idea that um, when your mother uh, found she was pregnant with you is because it was at a costume fitting and she realized she <laughs> couldn't fit into the costume. Yes. And then the next, the next paragraph is uh, your the um, the baby party the the uh, Pump reception shower. was hosted by Babe uh, Babe Hardy and his wife. Yes, this is Oliver I've, I've, Hardy. I, don't I've, you love I've, it? Of Laurel and Hardy, yeah. <laughs> but that's because your dad was working with them at Max Sennett Studio. Your mother and father were working for Max Sennett, and then Hal Roach, and I mean, it, yeah. it really is your uh, your book really goes through and touches base with everything we grew up with. Mm. Um, and I love just, I love the stories in the family and the, the acting and the studios. It, it's a wonderful chapter. Maybe for our audience without, uh, because there are so many examples, we won't give the book away. Uh, in your early years, in, in, in uh, uh, many ways, you were an apprentice uh, in Hollywood, you have the wonderful, I think you were in Occidental College uh, for some of these, and you were a production assistant and did other things on several of your dad's movies. Can you talk about a few of those just to give people a taste? Well, yeah, I, it might be, you might, your, your listeners might be interested that when I graduated from high school, a school called Harvard School in, in North Hollywood, California, it was then a military school, and uh, I, I didn't have anything to do after graduation, before I started Occidental. And I didn't have a job. And, and dad said, well, you can help me. So he gave me two assignments. One was to read the books that came over from Paramount Pictures, where his film company was, uh, and scripts that, you know, that, that they were suggesting might be interesting to him. And, and the other was to break down Theodore Dreiser's An American Tragedy, a great two-part novel because my father was about to begin writing the screenplay for a movie called A Place in the Sun that starred uh, Elizabeth Taylor, Montgomery Cliff, and Shelley Winters. Um, and I had to do everything, every character, all of it, into two least lo loose leaf notebooks uh, of Dreiser's American Tragedy. And then they, but the books that came over were, a lot of them were kind of treacly love stories that weren't too interesting to a 17 year old on warm summer afternoons. But one day, uh, a small book came, and I read it in, an in the afternoon. And I went to see my father that evening. And he was in bed reading. And I walked in and I said, Dad, I said, this is really a good book. I mean, it's a really good story. I think, I think you ought to read it. And he, he looked over and he said, well, 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 why don't you tell me the story? So I find myself pacing around his bed, trying to reconstruct in my mind the story of Jack Schaefer's novel, Shane, and to tell him that story. And of course, he made a classic movie out of that book. You know, I think what he was doing that summer was giving me an opportunity to discover whether I had any aptitude or any interest you know, in his profession. And, uh, and it, and it turned out that I did. I'll say <laughs> now you had a wonderful career in movies. Yeah. Um, obviously influential in making Shane come to the screen. Um, and you ended up being kind of a partner to your father. In, I in did. Film. Yes. And I, I worked with him on Shane and, and, and a, a, a place in the sun, Shane giant. And then on the Diary of Anne Frank, I became a producer, and I directed all of the location film that we shot in Amsterdam. Uh, and it appeared that, that 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 was the direction of my life. We were about to start the greatest story ever told, a very ambitious picture. And um, the President Kennedy had been elected, and he had appointed Edward R. Murrow, the great broadcaster, uh, to head the United States Information Agency, which was charged with telling America's story abroad. Um, and 
and, and a friend of mine and I wrote to Murrow because we heard Jacqueline Kennedy was going to take a trip to India. We thought we could make a wonderful documentary which would show how her interest in a foreign country and her care for other peoples would be a good thing for, to be seen around the world. And we hadn't heard from Murrow, but he was coming to Hollywood to talk to the moguls and the big directors at a dinner at Chasen's restaurant. So we sent him a message and said, would you like to meet with some, it is the new frontier, would you like to meet with some younger people? And so we had a Friday afternoon meeting with Ed Murrow, who was such an impressive man. And Paul Newman was there and Richard Zanuck and uh, others in their uh, 30s. And, uh, and the, the next day I got a call from Samuel Goldwyn Jr. And he said, Ed Murrow is staying at my father's house. Uh, he, he wonders if you could come and see him on Sunday afternoon. And I said, well, of course, and of course. I said, well, you can, may I ask what it's about? And he said, well, he's looking somebody to run the motion picture division of USIA. And uh, and I've quickly said, gosh, Sam, I'm, I'm like my father's partner and we're starting the greatest ever t story ever told. I wouldn't want to waste Mr. Murrow's time. And Sam said he understood. And the phone rang 15 minutes later and it was Sam. He said, Ed says, you won't be wasting his time. And <laughs> so I went to see him and you know, it was tremendously impressive and talking with him alone. And, and he asked me to, I was 29 years old and he asked me to take this job at running the motion picture division of the United States Information Agency. And I said to him the same thing. I said, you know, I, I, unfortunately, I'm like my father's partner. I can't leave him. But then three days later, Dad and I were walking to lunch at the 20th Century Fox studio. I remember it so well. And we hadn't talked about this. And it came up and I told him and he stopped and he looked at me and he said, you know, I think you'll have to do it. And he had left Hollywood to cover, make movies of combat in World War II. And I think he saw this as an opportunity for me to find perhaps a way, you know, out from under his shadow that I never considered it a shadow. And so it was a huge change of life. And I went to work in Washington and, and the very exciting Kennedy era of the new frontier. And it, it did change the course of my life. Well, you know, it seems well, to me that um, uh, one of the examples that you've given, uh, you call it my place in the sun. And it seems that not only was your father very supportive of you with activities involving projects that he was working on so you could get a sense for whether or not you should be in the business and it, in fact your father was figuring out whether or not he should push you there someplace else but even though you were becoming very successful working with him he saw this as an opportunity for you to strike out on your own and probably uh, uh, because he loved you as a dad that this is your place now to go make your own mark in your own name. And I just, yeah. as, as people read that chapter and, and, and they see that you're beginning to do that, and, and then you went on to AFI and the Kennedy Center Honors and all those other things that you're so well known for behind the scenes as well as in the industry in front of, of, of the scenes, you're recognized for that. Uh, your dad, this is, uh, that's why I called it a love story as much as it was a biography and an autobiography about how he unselfishly <clears throat> wanted you to make your own way and mm -hmm. establish yourself as your own uh, entity. No, that's, that's true, yes. George, it, it must have been a, a big come down in the sense <laughs> to go from Washington wages, yeah. pardon me, Hollywood wages, to Washington wages. Now, of course, it was a big step up uh, in career and uh, independence and a whole lot of other things, right. given what happened. But you were making big money in Hollywood. Yeah, and no, you I wouldn't. I, I, for I, government I, wages. Yeah, I would not change anything because I, I, I think I was making eighty thousand dollars a year. I was twenty nine years old, and the top salary in the in the agency was eighteen thousand. But it was I, I never flinched. I was single. I could afford it. And and my father uh, in 1942 
when he would become one of the most successful directors in Hollywood. Uh, and he saw Leni Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will, the German director, which showed the, the Nazi Congress and all of the troops and the zealous uh, Hitler youth. And he saw what film was doing in the war. And he said he could not stay home in Hollywood. So he uh, got a commission to serve overseas as heading combat photography in the war in Europe. And I think his salary went from a very substantial figure to uh, to $560 a month or something like that. <laughs> well, of course, um, in, in, during your years at the U.S. Information Agency, uh, this was the Cold War. Right. And uh, you made, under your uh, supervision, they made over 300 documentaries while you were there. Every year. Yeah. I, 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 just an amazing feat. And I think, you know, that really brought the Cold War home to a lot of people. Well, our job was to 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 tell America's story abroad. Actually, our films with a couple of exceptions, were not shown in the United States because they, they but the law was they didn't want the, 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 every president controls the USIA budget. They did not want him to make, be making films that would be shown in the United States to his advantage. So we had a rule that our films were, and we made films on a variety of subjects, but they were shown in theaters and on television, and even on mobile units in Africa, overseas. Uh, uh, there's so much that we could cover, but read the book. I will tell you that the price of admission of the book for the photographs alone, no. because uh, uh, George, you your, and your entire family being theatrical, saves a lot of photographs. So there's a lot of family stuff in there that just uh, nobody probably ever seen before uh, outside yeah. the immediate family. Uh, but I have, I have one last question for you. Uh, uh, I was thinking about all through the book because you are a namesake of a, of, of a famous and accomplished parent. And there have been, been a lot of people like that, but uh, Fairbanks, you can go on and on about mm -hmm. somebody who was junior. Uh, right. Uh, but one that sort of struck me as, as, uh, and I wonder if you could comment on it, Alan Ladd Jr., okay, and you uh, have a history, not that you were both in the Air Force, because I don't think you were in the Air Force at the same time, but because of Shane and that right. picture, and the path, your relationship with your family versus his relationship with his family just hit me as so striking. Can you talk anything about uh, uh, how you feel about that? Or anything? Well, uh, Alan Ladd Jr. was known as Laddie, and um, he was a, a bit younger than I, um, but he became a head of, of 20th Century Fox and, and was behind the making of many, many great films. And he was one of those examples of a, a, a son of a famous father that that did very well and there were many stories of the opposite kind where the sons had difficulty george I, I, before we wrap this up um i really really insist that you give me two quick perspectives on what you did after you left the uh, uh, usia you created the Kennedy Center and the Kennedy Center Honors and uh, the American Film Institute. I, I need to hear from your lips about those. Well, uh, yes, it went a bit, but I was in this situation in Washington where I was in this government agency and I knew about film and had ideas about it uh, that were not very current or prominent at that time. And so when the time came to start the National Endowment for the Arts, they knew what to do about, about music and, and symphony orchestras and opera, but they had no idea what to do about film. Somebody said, you can't give a grant to Warner Brothers. And <laughs> so uh, I was asked, and I had been interested in 
and about film preservation and training young filmmakers. So I, uh, I was called on and I advised on that they start an American Film Institute. And then I was asked to run it and I did it and I ran it, got it for 12 years and got it established and it's still going strong. Uh, it has 50th anniversary uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so that was part of it. And then along the same t time, I was very inspired by President Kennedy in so many ways. And I, 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 we, we had conversations, but mainly it was just who he was and what he represented. And <clears throat> the offices of AFI were in the Kennedy Center in Washington, and we had an AFI theater. Um, and I had this idea that, that the great figures in the performing arts should be honored. And I went to the head of the Kennedy Center, and my presentation to him was one sentence. I said, carved in the wall of this building in, mar in the marble uh, are the words of President Kennedy. Uh, he said, I look forward to an America that won't be afraid of grace and beauty. I look forward to, to an America that will honor achievement in the arts, the way we honor achievement in business and statecraft. And there in one sentence was the encapsulated idea for the Kennedy Center Honors. And I was inspired by President Kennedy in so many ways and that we were able to create that. And and uh, and I, I've had the honor to produce and write it, co-produce and write it for 37 years. And, and, and in the process, we honored 189 people in those years. And just to have gotten to know all those amazing figures in the performing arts was just such a, added such richness to one's life. Certainly did. Uh, your legacy, I think, is unique and rivals your father's legacy, I, of which I know you are very proud of, of him. I am indeed. Um, yeah. I have to tell you, I just love this book. It's a, it's a history book. It's a family history book. It's, uh, you know, it takes me back through my life, going back to uh, post-World War II, growing yeah. up uh, in the shadow of the Cold War, uh, through it takes me back through movies, movie stars, and names that I, I grew up with, and then forward into, you know, the AFI and the film institute. And you're not you're not finished, are you? You no, have and, more and, to and do. I've got more to do, and 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 seven or eight presidents are in the uh, uh, during the, I work with during the time I was in Washington, and 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 I have a feeling that that you haven't mentioned it. But I think you were, I think you were quite taken with the chapter where I went to lunch with Elizabeth Taylor when, yes. when we were seventeen. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I didn't think we had time for that. But we <laughs> we don't we actually we don't have time for so much uh, that's in the book. So you're you're promoting the the book. The book is actually uh, people can go order it right now. Uh, uh, by the time they see this interview, maybe the day before it actually gets released, maybe a little bit after that. But uh, just maybe, uh, can you give us some insight of some projects that are uh, that we can talk about in six months or a year from now? Well, I think we, I've, I've always found it good to, 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 to wait and talk about them when they were becoming real. <laughs> and that I have a number of things that, you know, that I'm working on. And, and, uh, and I've really found that, um, it, that remaining interested and uh, and having a project of some sort, uh, you know, in my case, it's movies or television or books or plays. But for anybody, I think just to have something that challenges you, maybe something that's helping other people, um, it, it really keeps your mind alert and your energy. And uh, and so I, I, I went through through life, you know, my father, when I was working with him, I was, I was young George, you know, and when I went to USIA, I was 29 and I was the youngest. So I, I, I was very, and then when I started the AFI, I was just not quite 35. So I was always the youngest person in the room. So I've adjusted 
to no longer being the youngest person in the room, but I have the pleasure of of, uh, of, of being active in things that really interest me and and uh, and keep me keep me engaged. Well, that's good advice for our audience, I can tell you. And, and no matter how old you are, that's great advice. And and quite frankly, not only thank you for this wonderful conversation, but uh, we look forward to speaking to you again as uh, uh, you continue to do new and exciting and wonderful things, which, well, we should in our second act. So thank you again for taking the time with us and look forward to uh, seeing you again soon. And uh, recommend the book, My Place in the Sun, to everybody. Everybody... Yes. Not just everybody over fifty, although we'll really relate to it. Uh, yeah, uh, to and, and 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 it's got a, the the subtitle is "Life in the Golden Age of Hollywood and Washington," yes. which gives perspectives on 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 two sides of the continent. And you know what? There's a whole conversation to be had about how you brought together those two two um, major industries, if you will. Yeah, uh, which had never been functioning together before. So that's another interview. George, thank you so much. Really I appreciate great, you taking the time. I greatly enjoyed talking with both of you. Thank you. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.